Ah, technology. Now if I could just put the sound to work.
Hello and Hello. welcome. Welcome to the uh, first live presentation, even though that was a great presentation earlier. Um, this today we're going to sit down and talk. Well, the title of the program was Are Arc or Orcs a Problem or Is It Tolkien? A panel discussion about racism and representation. Well, it's slightly different than the original plan. Um, as you can see here, I'm by myself. Hello. And there's no panel here. I'm having a little trouble with the audio feedback. Um, That's me. And the panel's not here. I got some help from the oh, peanut gallery over on our feedback. Discord channel. Uh, so they'll be and piping in uh, throughout the uh, program. The um, but mostly you're going to hear me um, with a discussion about uh, orcs. Be because in, earlier this year, the there was a whole program. kerfuffle. Um, on Twitter, um, where kerfuffles happen, uh, um, about year, someone making a post that the orcs and their origins uh, within Twitter, both Tolkien and Dungeons and Dragons um, is inherently racist in its tone, a and a reactionary pushback that it's just a game, and we should really just be um, worried, not worried about that. So, and a that it's with that in mind. Um, what I'm going to do here is first I'm going to talk about sort of the history of orcs, like what the hell is an orc? Um, we'll go with the sort of the uh, epilogical, not epilogical, the word meaning uh, of orc, and we'll break it down uh, where it comes from, find out is really means not what you think it means, um, and then how Tolkien turns it into a creature for his books, uh, more, more fodder than thought out. Um, really more of a, not what you think a visual um, description than a thought out being. A um, and then we'll move on to Dungeons and Dragons and, uh, where it gets a little more fleshed out uh, out in terms of its social um, structure and, and so forth. And even a, a playable character in the half um, um, Then we'll then also we'll talk, talk about some of the modern Dragon changes to that to both reform the orc and other things. So. We're going to focus on the orc, but the conversation's not about orcs. It's about um, representation, author's intent, um, the arguments of today being applied to creations of the past, and that's where the archaeologist steps in, um, because we're, you know, these arguments are centered on things that were words that were, have long histories, uh, books that are you know, nearly a century old, um, but they are being used, they're being applied uh, to events from today, to sort of like quote Foucault's sort of use of archaeology. It's, it's not about recreating the past, it's about seeing how the past brings us to the point where we're at today. So that's sort of where we're going at there. So. First, a little bit about me, I sort of put that in front. Um, I'm Bill Ochter, I'm a contract archaeologist, so I'm not in the academy. Um, for the purposes of this, um, I've been playing video games for about 40 years, I've played tabletop role-playing games for about 30 years, and I've been a contract archaeologist for about 10 years. So I think that hopefully gives me some credibility. I've not much, but we'll go with it. Years, now, and I've been a contract um, for what we're years. actually looking for, so, but and also, I think that I'm uh, a co-founder of the uh, ArcheoRPG Network, uh, which is a network of archaeologists um, who also, are trying to find creative uh, ways of uh, using tabletop role-playing games uh, as a means of public network, archaeology to, of uh, outreach and so forth. Um, my personal dig is to dig a little deeper in it and to try to find a way of making tabletop role playing a true um, archaeo gaming thing. And I'll explain all these things as we go. This is more of the setup right now um, than anything else. So, with that, let's go on a little trip about learning Latin. And I'll explain all these things as we go. This is more of the setup right now than anything else. So, with that. Let's go on a little trip First about technical snafu of the day. There we go. A brief history of orcs. First technical snafu. Look at a sad, sad orc. 
That is definitely a much more modern interpretation. We'll get to that kind of stuff later. I'm pushing everything to the end, aren't I? That's called the tease. We we pros use that to uh, keep an audience enthralled. That is definitely a much more modern interpretation. So let's go before Tolkien. What you have behind the sign, which I didn't realize until I put the sign there, is a picture of Orcus. So let's go before Tolkien. Uh, Orcus, uh, in Latin, was the lord of the underworld, sort of the equivalent of Pluto. Um, And so that's a... That's sort of where the the uh, you know, we first see that grouping of three letters, uh, orc, meaning something from the underground, the underworld, and so forth, um, like that. And so that's the. Uh, then we get into the, sort of old English. Uh, then we start seeing uh, orcus being translated into orc prius. I will not uh, attempt to, to sort of uh, say those old English words. Uh, I'm sure there in, is um, an old English scholar watching this, and I will not embarrass myself in front of them like that. But to, what it does translate to uh, say is words, goblin, sure specter, or, or hell de- devil. So at this point now, we have the orc sort of fitting in to the equivalent in like of but goblin. What it does translate to... Uh, we also have a mentioning of a uh, orc type of uh, name, at least, uh, within Beowulf. There's a single mention of it, um, and that translates into ogres and elves and devil corpses. Um, so this is then putting in the idea that the uh, orc Nias is a devil corpse, sort of an, uh, an undead monster, an undead creature. And devil of some kind or another. Um, so this is then putting in the idea that the uh, so we, we see this in, in sort of the old corpse, English, where undead monster, uh, you know, undead the orca, the variations of, of orc or and orcas uh, uh, are translating into some sort of. Uh, so we, it's, it's, we're now circulating around some vague where, monster, uh, uh, evil know, spirit, undead yeah. creature thingy. By the time we get to the early modern period, we get um, orc, which is spelled O R K E. Is that on here? No. By the time, and that's used for more. Um, and so, in early uh, nursery rhymes, plays, um, fairy tales, especially uh, in this early uh, modern era. Um, we start seeing more of so what we would now call an ogre. Um, the creature, whether hairy or not, but it's typically large, um, who sneaks into houses, snatches children, and eats them. Um, that quarter sort of creature is what's showing up at that point. And so we sort of have the evolution in one way or shape or form from Orcus, the god of the underworld, to orc, ogre, uh, things that eat creatures. So how do we get to an orc? Well, here we are, once again, with a nice, with a nice, beautiful statue demonstrating uh, what I was just saying about the orc, ogre. Get all these things mixed up. And trust me, getting these things mixed up is kind of part of the point uh, when it comes to this. With a nice, beautiful statue demonstrating what I was just saying about the orc, ogre. I'm just now stuff. trying to get into the kind of Twitter chat to uh, see if, uh, Twitch to chat, I should say, to see if you guys are leaving any questions while I'm uh, floating around here. And I apologize for those on Discord right now. I'm getting a feedback, audio feedback, which is making it uh, difficult for me to uh, to listen. Uh, Twitch chat, see if you guys are leaving any questions while I'm here. And I apologize for those on Discord right now. Getting a feedback. Feedback, which is so, it where was I? Yeah, ooh, scary. Which now brings up to J.R.R. Tolkien. Let's see if the audio is fixed. How, in one way or shape or form, where, from Orcus, the god of the underworld, yeah. nope. to Orc, like Joker. Okay. Now brings up. So, for Tolkien, the it would appear at first that the Orc is strictly a fodder creature. It's a creature placed in 
the books in vague different spots um like in the hobbit it's mentioned twice and it's mentioning is then strictly the fact of um the hobbits know what they look like um and it's sort of implied that they're just larger goblins that becomes more fleshed out in Lord of the Rings, of, where they are pretty much larger um, goblins, and somehow used um, in the creation of the uruk um, But we um, never learn anything about orc culture, um, the orc motives. Uh, there are no orc characters, per se. There are some named orcs throughout the Lord of the Rings, um, but they seem culture. to be more, more there to move the plot forward. Uh, rather than to be there as a character, uh, per se. Um, to take a quote from uh, Tom Shipley, who was a Tolkien scholar, uh, there can be little doubt that the orc entered Middle-earth originally just because the story needed a continual supply of enemy over whom one need feel no compunction. So the orc is there to be a creature um, that can just be slaughtered over and over again, and the reader will not feel... Um, bad about it. Sort of in the way of modern first-person shooters, if you put Nazis in there, or demons, if it's Doom, um, you don't feel as bad, or shouldn't feel as bad, or at least that's what the developers want you to think, um, as bad uh, with that. So, but there's a little, there's already a little bit of controversy uh, with that. Tolkien writes a couple letters uh, where he discusses the orcs um, in, um, in his collected letters. In letter 153, he mentions orcs who f are fundamentally a grace of rational incarnate creatures, though horribly corrupt is no more so than many men to be met today. Um, so the implication there, it's sort of the uh, orc is sort of the worst face of uh, humankind um, at that point. So, so we got that there. And we have another quote from a different letter, uh, which brings us a little more controversy. This is from letter 210. The orcs are def definitely stated to be corruptions of the human form seen in elves and men. They are, or were, squat, broad, flat-nosed, sallow-skinned, and with wide mouths and slanted eyes. In fact, degraded and repulsive versions of the, to Europeans, least lovely Mongol types. Reading that, that definitely transfers this from a strictly fantasy makeup to a modeling after actual humans and making judgments uh, upon the appearance and qualities of said humans. Um, this, these would be then humans from, from his perspective from the East, um, from Asia. So that definitely starts bringing us into sort of the the, the uh, troubles there. So much so that we have a we have a John Magon M A G O U N um, who, because of this and the use of the term Southrons from Harad, um, who are the sort of dark skin darker skinned humanoids which come to the aid of Mordor. Um, he develops this uh, moral geography uh, of Middle Earth um, with the North being uh, simple people, the West being good people, South being sophisticated people, and the East being evil. So the Northwest is the Shire. There are good homely folks. Um, the Southwest is Gondor with good complicated folks. The Southeast are, is Mordor, evil and scheming, and Harad, evil and intricate. It's interesting that on this moral geography, there is no Northeast. And to, to quote uh, 
So that definitely starts bringing us into sort of the the, the uh, troubles there. The Tukot Megan. So much so that we have a, uh, with his Southrons from Harad, Tolkien yeah, had, in view of Magon, John Megion, written uh, with writing in the J.R.R. Tolkien and Encyclopedia, and constructed a fully expressed Southron moral geography from, Harad, from the Hobbit's home uh, in the Northwest, sort of evil in the East, dark skin, dark and skin, imperial sophisticated decadence in the South. Megan explains that um, Gondor is both virtuous being West and has problems being South. Mordor in the southeast is hellish, while Harid is the extreme the south, regresses into wa hot savagery. So the hot, hot, hot. northwest is the Shire, they're a good home we folks. So, um, the southwest so now we're starting to see that the folks. orcs themselves the could be problematic, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And right, as the Shipley quote I quoted earlier, I'm out of order. Uh, uh, about the, the orcs Earth. first originally being there as North fodder. Being, uh, simple people, the West being good people, Here we South have a depiction people, of orcs, a visual depiction of orcs people. from so the, the uh, movie. I don't know the if these are cast extras uh, or, or cosplay. I'm almost going to go with cast extras the where those South suits are really good. Is... Um, but you kind of see there, there's sort of the... the, the um, darker skin, teeth. You have the tusk on the one protruding there. Their, you know, their armor is adored in various forms of uh, skull trophies. Um, their their uh, armor itself is haphazardly put together, as if it's made from scrap rather than these creatures constructing their own equipment. So you can see sort of the attempts to show sort of the bestial nature. Or savage nature um, of orcs, uh, even in sort of the modern definitive telling of the Lord of the Rings. So one other. Before we get to uh, sort of the sub, how they're confusing on here, on here I want to talk about one other sort of a controversial study. Of the orc. So uh, back in 2018, sort of uh, James uh, Menendez Hodes wrote uh, two uh, articles on his blog um, entitled Orcs, Britons, and the Martial Race Myth. Um, in the first part, A Species Built for Racial Terror, um, he has quotes here quote, We say Tolkien invented orcs as we know them today. More precisely, he synthesized their nature from various traditional characterizations, not of mythical creatures, but of real-life humans. Some of these characterizations came from popular European conceptions of the greatest threats to Western civilization. Others came from pseudoscientific frameworks of racism, some of which Tolkien would have encountered in his academic training. But Tolkien would meet the most germane theory to his works in the military uh, service with his sort of with the British army the fallacy the of the martial race um, so there we're going to see a lot of things we're going to keep talking about going forward and we're going to talk about some of the rebuttals uh, to this item after we talk about Dungeons and Dragons but first let's let's talk about the idea that um, the essentializing of race um, that a, a Race can be of a single mindset, a single community, Stick with and a single Just a little focus. bit of uh, um, technical difficulties these group to of everyone people watching. Are a martial race because they are warrior. It's a warrior race. Can't have race. anything nice these days. I've heard that term before. Um, all they are good at is fighting. Now you know it's a backhanded compliment to say they're excellent at fighting, but it's also dismissive of the fact that they're incapable uh, of doing anything else besides fighting. Um, so that's that's where a lot of that's at least part of the uh, concerns um, going on here. And one quick aside, uh, for those who are in the Discord chat, I am sorry I'm getting too much feedback uh, for to listen on that. But the Twitch channel, twitch.tv/archaeobar. 
tw twitch.tv slash archeothoughts um, has a much clearer things and you could ask your questions in the uh, chat there. I'm sorry about that. I was really hoping to get the audio worked out. We might work on it in between shows so it can be better uh, as the con goes on. But that is the beauty of live presentations. You never know what's going to happen. Anyway, so let's get back here. Uh, let's talk about the use of goblins, orcs, and orakai in Tolkien's work. The first thing you need to know, it's hey, ambiguous it? and it depends on the circumstances. As I mentioned before, uh, while Tolkien will spend volumes discussing the lives, the lineage, and the culture of elves, the one creature he explicitly creates, the orc, he hardly spends any time actually developing. So it's not surprising to say that we, do, we have them basically conflated with goblins in The Hobbit. Uh, the movies try to make it a little clearer with their evil um, orc who has his vengeance against... Man, those movies were so bad I can't remember any of them. <laughs> I'm sorry for anyone who loves The Hobbit trilogy. Then we get to the orcs. They're a little more defined in Lord of the Rings. They're kind of still interchangeable with the goblins. They're kind of, you know, they're just taller. Um, for the most sakes. Um, in the movie, they get used to uh, create uh, the Urukai. Um, and the Urukai are just a sort of a magical... Um, hybrid of the orcs created by Sauron in Modor um, that is a creature that is uh, more resistant to the sun the, one of the uh, gimmicks in the uh, Tolkien telling is that these creatures are so evil and so dark they are afraid of the light the light is the uh, uh, is the bane to these evil creatures if you need like metaphors beating you upside the head. Speaking of beating up, being beaten upside the head, let's go to Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, let me see if I can fix something. I'm getting feedback. All right. Just going to do a little audio fixing right now, live on air. Is anybody still here? Okay. So, let's now talk about Dungeons and Dragons. So, we have Tolkien. He creates the orc as a necessary fodder um, for his Middle Earth stories. Uh, needless to say, um, the Tolkien Middle Earth stories, um, nearly every writer and game developer of high fantasy or even low fantasy, we can honestly say is derivative of Lord of the Rings. Yay, people are saying I sound good. Excellent. So, what do we mean? We mean they're pretty much ripping off completely um, the skeleton of Lord of the Rings. They're taking the elves, they're taking the humans, they're taking the idea of Strider and turning it into a ranger for Dungeons and Dragons. Um, they're taking the idea of the Hobbit. Oop, it's copyrighted, so we're going to call them halflings. Um, the elves are magical, split between sort of this divine high magic and sort of this more woodland magic, you know, like in the Hobbit. 
Um, so we, we start having these derivative traits. That includes taking over the orc. But unlike Tolkien, the Actually, let me do one thing real quick. If no one's paying on attention onto the other channel, I'm going to turn that off. <gasps> it's a slideshow. What? Well, that isn't helping. Stop. Darn computers. They are the worst. Nope. All right, that should work. Let's get back to this. Um, I'll probably edit that out at some point. So. So we have that with Dungeons and Dragons. So let's dive in and find out what Dungeons and Dragons has to do with orcs. So the uh, Dungeons and Dragons has been through five editions since the uh, mid 1970s. So for over 40 years, um, they've been refining um, this. Um, this is from the fifth edition, the one that came out in the mid 2010s. So this is not a description from 1974 or anything like that. Orcs are savage raiders and pillagers with st stooped posture, low foreheads, and piggish faces with prominent lower canines that resemble tusk. So yeah, the, the idea of the orc savage continues on into... into this. Um, now let's go back to uh, James Menendez, who I was talking about before. Ah, we'll get to Volo in a bit. Um, Tolkien's decision to reify racism in the concept of fantasy races made it into Dungeons and Dragons largely unchanged. And in Dungeons and Dragons, you have the case here of racial essentializing. Uh, once again, like I've seen before, um, there are distinct races. They get they actually get distinct bonuses within the game itself, based upon which race you pick. They have certain characteristics. Halflings are lucky. Elves get a bonus to their magic. Dwarves are hardy, and they get a, a bonus to their constitution. Halflings are, f uh, uh, not halfling. Half elves are mysterious, so they get a bonus to their dexterity. So sort of these generalized character uh, stereotypes that are races get essentialized and put into the game as an actual bonus, um, which is you know if you spend more than a moment thinking about it, gets way too close to sort of the pseudo scientific anthropology of the 19th and early 20th century uh, with the attempts to uh, measure, use the physical form of the human body as a means to judge uh, behavior and character. Um, so that that's it's by itself is a slippery slope. But at this point now, it's take it's been it's been normalized. Uh, you talk to someone about this and they'll go, it's just a game. What are you talking about? It's just the game. Um, that's how normalized the idea of um, these races being, having certain attributes comes into play 
then there's the whole messy question of cross breeding for lack of a better term maybe I'll get to that So to go to some more, some more of the Menendez stuff, T D Dungeons and Dragons, like Tolkien, makes race literally, literally, ah, eh, he's saying the same thing I just said, so never mind. All right, so let's talk about the one race, playable race, in Dungeons and Dra in, in the original player's handbook of Dungeons and Dragons. I brought props, people. And that is the half work. To uh, now we can go back to Menendez. Uh, to quote here, uh, so half works are already uncommon and exotic. Orcs are even in this book, aren't even in this book. They're not in the player's handbook. They appear instead in the monster manual, which I'll get to in a second, uh, where monsters generally only acceptable to use and play as non-player characters by the dungeon master for the dungeon master's control. So yeah, there's always been sort of a controversy around the half work. Um, the idea of the half work is uh, someone who's been rejected by. No, 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 no. <sighs> All right, I'll see if I can go back in a second. The half-orc is a tragic figure. Um, they've been rejected by both worlds and are sort of, you know, it's sort of built in their adventuring plot hook. Um, they're out to be an adventurer because there's really no other place in the world for them. Um, and... In the monster manual, orcs are strictly a, a martial race uh, with singular focus on destroying the civilized world. They're not very complicated. Orcs see a good character, or even a neutral, the races of men uh, as... Uh, no, 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 that wouldn't work here either. Um, if they see the player characters, they're going to attack and try to kill them, is basically what an orc does in here. Um, there's a few smarter ones that are organizing everything, but in general, their job is to do that. There is an interesting little supplementary book, Volo's Guide to Monsters. In it, it, it um, fleshes out some of the other uh, monsters, races in the uh, Dungeons & Dragons universe. Uh, to give them a little more background, history, and so forth. So it talks about the orcs and, and, and the gods they pray to, and gives, and finally, for the first time, sort of gives a culture of some kind uh, to the orc. It is still a very martial culture. It is still very singularly focused on conquest. It's still very imperialistic in nature. It's still... For lack of a better term, they're savages. But the orc player character could sometimes be noble. So there's a problematic place there. So, but also in this book uh, is the option of playing an orc as a player character. Now they recommend um, this to be a little trickier type of character because by their very nature, um, they're they're hostile to anybody who would be player characters. So their, their suggestion is to use the orc as first being have been raised outside their culture. Um, so the culture of the orc is toxic. But if you were to take them out of the culture and have them educated or raised someplace else, then you could turn them into noble creatures. Once again, echoes of very bad things. The um, Indian schools in North America, it almost has a ring to. Um, now, with all these examples uh, that I'm pointing out that are problematic, 
I am not going to make any implications that any of these things were placed in here intentionally. Um, I think these mostly are cultural artifacts of the people who are writing these things. Um, they've written in a culture, they, they come from a culture where a lot of these ideas are normalized. Um, so they are spread without thought. Um, and which is, I think, is a lot of the case here. What, what's needed is sort of a, and what's where, what's sort of the main thesis on this orc side of things is that we sort of need to do a critical reading of the games we play, of the activities we do, um, because they may have been created without thought to their larger implications. And that's not, you know, that's not a PC thing. That's a seeing things for what they are. So, so with that, you've erased it out of the culture, but even then, their, their monster tendency is still going to be there. It gives you a little flavor as a character to go rage out once in a while. If, because um, they show limited signs of empathy, love, and compassion. I mean, we can't expect uh, an orc player character to become a poet or a bard or something and just, you know, sing the beautiful love songs of the world. Well, I want to play one like that. And that is part of the beauty of Dungeons and Dragons. So here gives you a little idea A little idea of the culture of the uh, orc as laid out in Volo's Guide to Monsters. Savage and fearless, orc tribes are ever in search of elves, dwarves, and humans to destroy, motivated in their hatred of the civilized races of the world and their need to satisfy the demands of their deities. The orcs know that if they fight well and bring glory to their tribe, Grumsh will call them home to the plain of Asheron. It is there in the afterlife where the chosen ones will join Grunsch and his army in their endless extraplanar battle for supremacy. So there's almost a popular notion of Norse mythology sort of built into that. Of, of sort of a um, orcish Valhalla, as it were. Uh, in here, because all they're after is conquest and glory to satisfy their gods. Now, some other um, derivatives of the Tolkien legacy, um, which also use orcs, have tried different approaches. World of Warcraft, a, a game that's been popular for over 10 years now, um, has tried to walk a fine line between orcs that are actually heroic characters. I'm thinking of Thrall uh, and uh, with all orcs that are evil characters. And that all came after I uh, um, I left. But then they, 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 the problem with the World of Warcraft is they walk very heavily on that noble savage uh, sort of line with the tribes and their shamans and so forth. I mean, there's other problems with World of Warcraft too. You have the trolls, uh, which seem to be derivative of the descendants of slaves from the Caribbean. And you have the Tauren, which appear to be Plains Indians. Um, pure and simple. Um, so th that's those things. But I'll let the video game people talk about that. I just want to bring up some other examples. Even within the world of Dungeons and Dragons, you have Eberron, which, which sort of tries to make uh, some differences there. Um, you, have world, uh, you have Warcraft, which makes orcs, Warcraft 40,000 at least, uh, makes orcs an alien creature. Um, and it's O-R-K rather than O-R-C, which in later times uh, also became uh, Tolkien's preferred method of spelling the word. So, so you see the orc in, in a lot of a lot of different uh, things. But it's, what, what's what's weird though is that this basic idea that the physicality of it that Tolkien describes, which is pretty much all you have to go on, 
this, you know, sort of larger creature, whether it's green skinned or gray skinned, um, the protruding tusk from the lower jaws, um, the sort of savage nature, those carry over in sort of all the iterations uh, of orcs. Um, so it's interesting that, that for something so vague, uh, we have that kind of a uh, reiteration. So, oh. so I promised, I promised to give you guys some uh, reactions uh, to this entire idea. Um, that this is sort of a, a malarkey and that, you know, people are overreacting. This is a work of fiction. It is not meant to be drawn on uh, from real life. And um, why are we trying to judge things by today's standards type of arguments? So, to quote um, a Christopher A. Ferguson uh, for a... Uh, from a blog post he wrote in Psychology Today, no, orcs aren't racist, quote, no, orcs aren't racist. Uh, and D&D isn't promoting racism. There's no good scientific evidence to back up the claims of the new woke wave of moral outrage and policing. There are real issues around race and racial inequality we need to work on in the U.S. and around the world. But as far as D&D goes, let's try to tune out society's moral entrepreneurs as best we can and get back to gaming. Um, here's another one from a Spencer Bakuli on the Bounding Into Comics website uh, from an article titled, Progressive Nerd Culture Outlets and Tabletop Creators claim depiction of orcs are problematic and racist. Quote, orcs, the monstrous fictional fairy uh, fantasy race, are once again under attack by nerd culture outlets and creators who are unable to separate fiction from reality for failing to conform to their very specific standards of progressive politics. So, so the main argument against um, this idea of looking into these texts, uh, looking into this play as a form of um, racism was one, and there was sort of a straw man idea that um, by reading these things, it was going to indoctrinate the players into sort of racist beliefs or values. And I haven't found an argument yet for that. There may be one out there, but I haven't, all the arguments are about the text, uh, not the implication of the player, which is its own problem. And we'll get to that after the video, if it works this time. <laughs> um, so. So the idea here is that we have first in the book books where you know J.R.R. Tolkien is you know doing race essentialization uh, in his books to create his characters. Uh, he's not the first or only author to ever do this. Um, you need you need, you're writing speculative. Um, you can't make up everything, so you look around you and you adapt what you know, and you put that into your book. Um, the pr so that's, that's, that's the first step of this. The second step is that this was all taken without criticism. There was, there was no critical thought when these things were adapted, uh, into other plays. In fact, it was seen as an asset. Uh, if you look into game developer books, um, you will see that they are very helpful. They enjoy, they, they recognize that you're using stereotypes and they think it's a good thing because stereotypes, one, makes it easier for you as a writer, a developer, 
to write your tales because there's already an established theme uh, going on here an established tropes there that you can just you feed into those tropes and that's less heavy lifting you have to do as an author uh, secondly it's it's it goes with uh, the expectation of the player the player is already familiar with these tropes and they will once again just fall into it and it becomes easier to go and you can do things without necessary long explanations uh, because creating brand new things from scratch um, is a potentially very dangerous thing as a writer goes uh, because it could be absolutely rejected um, by your audience and there all your hard work goes to play and if it's a work such as a game uh, your game might fail because your characters just aren't engaging or relatable um, so the safe route for developers is to use stereotypes and tropes however that's not all game developers um, there are a lot of small especially smaller developers who are moving beyond this point if you go on to drive through rpg.com where a lot of small developers sell their their works you will see alternative rules for orcs, alternative rules for various creatures uh, in here, and alternative rules for humans that takes away the human essentials and talks more about culture uh, rather than essentializing. Um, you see, oh, you see works like works like the Zwei Handler, a uh, new book that came out last year, where they explicitly talk about being gender neutral. Uh, in their work. You have the new uh, sort of um, uh, additions being played in the world of Call of Cthulhu, not necessarily Call of Cthulhu the game, which are explicitly saying up front that H.P. Lovecraft was a racist and a lot of his works contains uh, racist uh, tropes, stereotypes, and harmful things. Uh, and that's not what the, the game developers stand for and they're hoping that their game moves beyond um, those tropes. So there is, there are being steps being made um, to, to move beyond this. So, but it is an ongoing cultural debate, and I think that's where the archaeologist comes in. And this will be my last part before we go to the video. Because we are actually having, when, when these arguments come up, whether it's the one in August this year, whether it was 2018, whether whenever it was back, these are all arguments over objects, the text, the game, the books, the movies, the toys, the everythings, um, and the present, how society is today. What do we define as play? Is, is play an area of escape or is play like everything else in our culture a reflection of that culture? Um, so these are the discussions and debates that we're having uh, now, but we're using the past to sort of stage our arguments. That's a perfect place for an archaeologist to sit. All right. So this is the attempt. And yes, um, I'm seeing here in the chat, if you haven't already seen the Critical Bards Roundtable, it is an absolute must-see. Um, that's the, uh, an excellent discussion going far beyond where I'm even touching today uh, on these very themes and beyond. Um, so I highly recommend it. I don't know what the exact link is. Maybe somebody in chat can throw in the YouTube link in there so that everybody else can see it. So with that in mind, I am going to try to share a video. This is back from a year ago. Um, on the occasional show still digging on the Archeo RPG network, um, where we first discussed uh, the Menendez articles. Uh, it was a panel discussion between myself, Tom Cuthbertson, uh, Amanda Gomes, and Sarah Head. And in that discussion, we went back and forth about the different uh, ideas and tropes that were being le levied on both the Tolkien and the D&D side on that. In the pre-production, uh, I was having some trouble with audio. So I'm going to start just now. Please tell me um, 
if you can hear this. If not, I am going to have to move on. All right, I'm going to try one more thing. The other day. Uh, that was the one more thing. I don't, I, it's it's more ethnicity. When the, the word is ethnicity now, not race, because um, race is a social construct and complete bullshit. In a certain way, race is a fun thing to talk about. Um, I have my serious lighting on me now. Okay, it does work Whatever. now? Good, 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 good. good. Um, but, uh, it, you just say white, black, and Asian now. You don't say Negroid and Caucasianoid and, um, Mongoloid anymore. I had to actually think about it. Um, I don't know if white, black, and Asian is any really better, but they're more recognizable terms for the modern era, and they are, I don't know, less negative? I know Asian really isn't the best word to use because it really does kind of just lump like a third of the planet into a group. It's a very broad stroke. Yeah, it really is very broad. But I think actually, like, didn't they start breaking down, um, haven't they started breaking out Native American now too? Like that's its own category. I don't know, it's been forever. It depends since it's on what, what country you're in and which department you're in and what mm -hmm. government agency you're in and all that kind of good stuff. Because the books I have, like I said, my books are old enough that I think my books were printed right before the big theoretical shift away from using these terms to using new terms and away from the whole concept of race and instead we're using ethnicity. Um, so that's about who my, my attention right. is about. But the, the, the critical thing, like to go back to orcs, you know, when you we need to talk serious stuff now, we, we're talking orcs. Uh, <laughs> I keep talking about, you know, fantasy stuff like archaeology. Uh, serious business time. We need to talk orcs. Um, is that orcs, and I guess the first, I mean, I could get jump at however we want to. We can jump back and forth between both articles. Uh, the second article gets much more into things like D&D &D and sort of modern interpretations of it, which takes it away from sort of uh, an, a, an Asian stereotype into a, a, a nice American uh, black stereotype. Uh, so it's sort of a, you know, we took it from the British, that we Americanized it, so we put our own American uh, spin of prejudice on it. And so instead of being uh, like original orcs and the Tolkien thing are sort of s small, thin creatures, your typical orc in a Dungeons and Dragons world is going to be this big, burly, martial, muscular creature. It's not very smart, but it's very uncanny. I'm going to go grab my monster manual right now to see if I can find an orc. Um. I think I think we also need to kind of just lay just for people who are who are not anthropologists or archaeologists or have any you know genetic background or whatever. Um, um, race is not real. Uh, it is it is fully a social construct. The things that we perceive of as race are um, they're basically just just common mm, physical traits among a, I can't think of a better word than breeding group, but that's, that is kind of the word for it, I suppose. Uh, that's not, that's not the right word though, is it? No, that's not the right it's word. The, yeah. mm, not, not community, because it's more specific than that. It can be very specific to a community though. I mean, if you're using community in like the broad sense, or, that's why I say mm. of ethnicity, because a lot of ethnicities have common physical traits. I'm thinking like, yeah you know, European Jewish communities and, uh, you know, the obvious ones, African and Hispanic community ethnicities and that kind of stuff. But the, the, the really tricky part with race is it's a complete social construct and it will change depending on where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. But as far as being a social reality, race is very real oh, because sure. you're your personal experience, your miles, your mileage will vary depending on what 
race you're perceived to be by the society or the culture group that you're in. So, you know, I can sit here and say race doesn't exist. And then somebody who's black is going to come up and be like, uh, excuse me, because <laughs> their whole their whole life is defined by right. their race. I mean, yeah, they're race, it's, completely socially constructed here in America, but it's because it's, 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 it's yeah, it's, it's 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 two things happening simultaneous. Yeah. One, it's not it doesn't exist Two, it is real right. in that it has an effect on your life. I mean, the way to think about it is the economy is a social construction. The economy yeah. doesn't exist. There is no such thing as money. Money is just a, a name we, we ascribe to an idea. If this, if I were to walk out of here and say, well, money doesn't exist. It's not real. They're still going to want my car payment at the end of the month. Um, it has or still has a very much real effect on my day to day life. Um, agreements we've created. Um, you know, race is a social construction with, with, that that feed into uh, systems of power uh, mm -hmm. within our society, uh, and they are made up out of whole cloth. They are imagined. Um, it's probably the best way of putting it. They they are imagined constructs, but they are very much real. People live, people die because of of, of, of concepts such as race. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't want we don't want to diminish it in, in, in that way, shape, or form. Um, but we want to like we want to make sure if you take away nothing else, that it is not natural in any way, shape, or form. We are yeah. trying to denaturalize this concept for you. Um, it is there's nothing innate about you know anything you've ever heard about. Well, you know black people can do this and Asian people are good at that, and white people can do that, that's all BS. Um, but on a systemic level, is, is, your, is your race going to directly impact, potentially directly impact your life? Yes. Um, that, but as you were saying, this does go back to the more serious topic of gaming, Especially when it comes to, yeah, oh, I beat you to it, huh? <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, the whole idea of uh, race is real in most fantasy style D&D &D games, or that was redundant, but anyway. So, would you call a D&D &D a raced realist game? I don't know what raced realism is. It's just racist. It's, it's, a, it's a white nationalist term, it's, it's, it's soft white, white nationalism. They try to like <laughs> all sorts of different, uh, you know, in, all in the same people. sense that American culture in general is white nationalist. Yeah, and they're not. Let's stop using nationalists. They're not nationalists. They're supremacists. They're white supremacists. Yeah. Well, nationalism comes from the concept that they want American white and like, anyway. Anyway, back to, back to orcs. Back to orcs. Back to orcs. Yeah, but the, 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 the actual mechanics of fantasy style games, even in uh, if people who aren't playing tabletop games, even if you're playing video games, a lot of times, like you have to select your character race or species and you get racial bonuses based on uh, what you pick. And it, some races are better at magic and some races are better at heavy weapons and some races are better at, I don't know, digging holes. Um, being angry. Being and angry. within the world. I mean, like, oh, how do people play dwarves because they like to be able to drink other people under the table? Like, what are you saying about dwarves, man? Um, but yes, I think it, it's very sad to say, but I think racism is inherent to role-playing games, but I don't think role-playing games are racist. Does that make sense? I think, in, in, I think it's, it's, it's the same kind of argument I was making before in the sense that Amer um, American culture is not it's it's built on a racist concept or was built by or in, in a racist concept and therefore subconsciously it's always going to have some some remnant of that without very drastic uh, intervention um, sure. but um, it, I mean it yes so to bring in a little, <laughs> so, so to bring in a little critical theory here, because if we're going to discuss serious things like orcs, you must bring in critical theory. Um, mm -hmm. it, it would be safe to say then that you know, things like like uh, role playing games are always already um, racist because they are within the superstructure uh, of, of of a white nationalist system or a racist system in general. 
So it's not inherently or intentionally, uh, this is not a, a condemnation of any of the creators, including Tolkien. Um, it's, it's more of a reflection of the society, you know, like all art, all art is a reflection of the societal times in which it is created. Um, and art is a great barometer of judging what were social norms uh, and, and acceptabilities during a particular time and place. Uh, and so, like any art, Dungeons and Dragons reflects that art of the late 20th century, uh, United States, coming right out of the civil rights era, a very tense time. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be baked in even if no one along the chain ever intended to be for it to be there. Um, uh, yes. Jump in, babe. All right, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm taking it all in. Also, it's still a little early here. Um, you could draw a Ford while you're doing it. So a proper, oh, a, a more modern uh, interpretation of, of an orc, maybe a more, you know, where to step forward. I, th I think Ford's a good representation of like the, what can we do from this point? Ford is a character on the uh, streaming show Critical Role, who's a half orc, and you, which is a whole. And, and you is a very, yeah, yeah, that yeah that that gets discussed pretty heavily in the in the articles that you posted. I was really um, confused by those articles. I'm not gonna lie, because like he kept saying that you can't play orcs and you can't play half orcs, and I, I think every game I've ever been in, someone has played an orc, or at least a half orc. Yeah. So, well, I don't the, know. The, uh, the the half orc has been in there for a while, but the but the whole concept is like orcs and goblins are inherently evil and and cannot really be played as 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 normal player characters has is starting to go away for sure at least as as part of the mainstream use of the game. There was also the problem since orcs themselves were not normally uh, player characters, even in fifth edition player's handbook, they're not a regular player character. You need to get. Volo's guide. I'm just showing off how many goddamn DD books I have. <laughs> um, to actually get the rules for uh, Gorks as a playable character. So the implication was also always never explicit, uh, but the implication was always there that half orcs themselves were products of some sort of sexual violence. Uh, yeah. was sort of always implied there, which also plays into some of these other racial stereotypes, which first existed. Oh, not, not first existed, which exist in Europe towards uh, people of the East and the United States towards people of African descent. Um, they sort I of like they're coming for they're coming for our women type of uh, stereotypes. I had I mean, some still kind of a thing. experience with role playing, and y'all, because <laughs> like I never picked up on that as a gamer, and my parents were gamers, so like I've never picked up on that. I think. Um, hmm. I think it's also the it really depends on the type of people that you play with because in the in the um, in the article he talks about a, a, like a play test for fifth edition before it actually came out and like the the DM was pushing real hard for um, um, for basically not not using orcs as player characters and then not um, you know and and not considering them even as people because there's like Towards the end of the description, there's a, they're, they're, like they, there's the, the orcs are, uh, there's like orc raiders or something. They have to go, right? You know, bust them out of this cave or whatever. And um, at the end of it, there's like orc children cowering in the corner, and one of them like goes up and kills one. Yeah, one of the other player characters yeah. uh, kills an orc child, and so right. the guy playing is like roll initiative he's ready to throw and then the dm closes down the the, the mid game right then yeah and the dm yeah the dm completely shuts it down um but i think but i think that's also not the i don't know if, i don't know if that is a common right i mean it sounds like a bad experience team. among that sounds like yeah. a bad yeah there's that one guy and it's usually the guy in every group who's just like the secret psychopath so that sounds like you know, that's what that guy was. Or there's always somebody who's got to be extra. I mean, there's always, I mean, the beauty of our play, role playing is that there's so many different kind of people and so many people get different things out of it. There are play, people who, who play the game for the role playing experience and they get right. deep into their character and explore right. it. Other players are trying to min max their stats completely yeah. so they can have as much, be soaked in as much blood by the end of the session. Well, you and have to win. The they, game, are the right? they are the murder. They have to win the game. They are the murder <laughs> hobos. No <laughs> winning role play. You walk into the. You walk into the uh, store 
and the uh, shopkeeper says hello. Your mage throws a fireball inside and blows everybody up. Look, that only <laughs> happens. You loot the place. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, though, I think we've stepped away a little bit. You know, kind of put a lot of the onus on the player, but you know, ultimately, when it comes down to, it's more of a critique of the system itself. And so far as we were saying, you know, society, you know, race being a construct and it being upheld, you know, within that given, you know, um, social sphere. If you look at D and D as a system in a whole, it works kind of on, in essence, categories and binaries. You know, good versus evil, and you know, what is your alignment? And you've given a race, in essence, an evil alignment. And that's what in part comes out in that article is the fact that you, we have as a whole within this D&D system, orcs are bad. And we've given them no agency in that whatsoever. <laughs> and I think an important distinction that sort of like absolves, uh, would, would, would not absolve uh, harm in the designs of these things is that they mean race by the fact that these different races, or at least some of them in game, are allowed to procreate uh, internally with, with viable offsprings, uh, implying that they are of the, of the same species, but different races of, of, or at least neighboring species. So that, you know, at least in the base game, humans, elves, and orcs are all of the same species, just different mm -hmm. races of that, where one is held as more intelligent and beautiful and grace aligned with the with the elves and the and the orcs are some sort of warlike creatures which aren't even worthy of being a playable character in the other ones you know it's, you're sort of half orc which of course you know that uh, that also brings up uh, a troubling uh, um descriptions for anyone who who is a mixed race uh descent the, the sort of the the for lack of better terms and the only way i know how to describe it an, Amer an american um, which is, I know, so I apologize now, would be the concept of the half-breed, um, where it's, it's, it's the sort of liminal person um, who, is out, who, is an out, who is an internal outsider. Uh, you see a lot in sort of American Western motif. You have the person who is maybe um, half, half Native American, half white, who is sort of your gateway character between those two worlds, but in the end doesn't belong to either one. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, what that sort of, what you hear that half thing, it's what that archetype uh, brings to mind. I think part of the issue going back to, um, critiquing the game itself is like Amma was saying, the, the, the necessary duality and the, the black and white nature of it. You are good. You are evil. I mean, yeah, your, your alignments span, you know, true new, or true good all the way to true evil. And, you know, you can be neutral in between, but. And most people prefer to play a neutral style character, at least in the groups that I've run in. But the game, the game really encourages you to pick one side over another. Um, I think this is why it, I prefer, you know, once once I got done playing D and D as a kid, I, I really started to enjoy the White Wolf games when they started coming out. And I'm sure there's a whole conversation that we could have had about those, but um, White Wolf was the first gaming system that I encountered where you you didn't necessarily there was a stereotype and the stereotype existed because that was what everybody was what everyone society thought of this group and you were encouraged to create a character within that that stereotype group but you were encouraged to make your character an individual because part of the the whole point of the game was there isn't black and there isn't white the game was all about the shades of gray in between um it was just also a horror based game so you know there were there were monsters and i mean you played werewolves and vampires and, and mages and fairies so i mean it's like not grounded in reality at all but you weren't you didn't have to pick a species or a race you could play non-binary characters and actually as the game matured um along with the player base you know you, you did start to see actual rules for generating non-binary characters and you know there's no such thing as racial racial stats in white wolf there is bonuses for the type of monster you are like if you're a vampire you get 
different bonuses than the werewolf. Um, so I guess that's still there. It, that's a very different like like mechanic though, and even even socially, because you're not you're not just inherently that thing. You like I, right. well, I, I don't I don't know a lot of the the lore behind White Wolf, but like for vampires and and werewolves or whatever, they're they're more things that are like they're not inherent. They're like a curse, or you're you're you know brought into society or whatever you know whatever whatever group we want to want to go into that. Um, so it's it still it still pulls you away from that that you know that that idea that this is this is just who you are because of who you how you were born. It's but, you know. And it's I the point of White Wolf was to rage against the thing that everybody said you have to be. You know, and, and you can embrace it if you want. To. I mean, it's your character, or whatever. You can do what you want. D and D is set up in a way that like. You know, we were talking about drow earlier. Like, what the hell are drow? And we're like, oh, they're the fallen and the cursed. And drow are inherently evil. And that's why characters like Drizzt and some of the other more famous uh, NPC drows are so cool because they're rebelling and they're they're breaking away from the evil and they're redeemed. And it's also about where, you know, where they're from. Those characters are typically from a place in the game world called the underworld. Uh, it's a place underground. They they are they are shy away from the light. They are the the repelled uh, things, and all things that are deep in the earth are evil. Right, exactly. Because well, we all know lives in the ground. Right, but I think it's something, something interesting, though. I mean, I don't know if we if we are going to have the answer for this, um, but it's interesting though that Dungeons and Dragons is the behemoth, though, in the world of, of tabletop role playing. Um, I'm familiar with the White Wolf. I haven't really played it that much. I played the game a little bit, and I'm trying to start playing it again uh, before the new game comes out, the video yeah, game. The new system. Um, but I would definitely like to play it. Maybe we'll have a one shot or a new, uh, maybe season two of our thing. We'll we'll try a different system, and we'll all be you know vampires. We're not. I haven't played a good vampire game in forever, so I'm down. Uh, but <laughs> but. It's it's the mechanics of Dungeons and Dragons that you see in so many other uh, other types of tabletop role playing games, other types of video games. The entire RPG genre uh, is 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 in some way, shape, or form variations of the D and D model. Even like your Final Fantasies and your JRPGs play upon a lot of these D and D style style myths. So. It has long legs, so it, I think it is still interesting, sort of, to the, the, the critique the structural underpinnings of this. And I and I like how this is all focused strictly on the orc, because you could probably do this about sort of all the character races um, in there. But by sort of like paying attention to the orc, it gives you that time to sort of sit there and think about it, and to sort of go on there. So like what Ama's drawing right now, um, the big guy in the middle is a typical how a uh, fifth edition orc would look like where the, the the more the more slight guy in the on the on the on the right who who still who still lifts okay he still lifts he's not that, <laughs> he's that weak even if he is weaker than his uh teeth girlfriend. <laughs> girlfriend or not girlfriend or not girlfriend not girlfriend y'all watch yeah. that show. we watch way too much that show yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> There's no uh, episode. Um, he's a half orc. Hang on, Amma's kind of famous. Oh, she is super famous. Three Amma's times now, twice, three, three times, three, three times. times. Her her art has shown up on Critical Role now. So because it's good, it is. Good. <laughs> Can't handle this. I, I'm aiming for. I'm aiming for four. Let me tell you. This is the real All reason right. she's not putting the video up is because at this point she can't stand the fame. Yeah, right. Can't, like, <laughs> can't, be can't do it. Just can't do it. Sorry, I'm trying to add a human for comparison here, too. Two guesses. I have no idea because I don't actually watch Critical Role. <laughs> oh, you need to. Well, you know, when you put the, when you give him a cat or a uh, octopus goggles, I'll know. He's got, he's got the holsters, though. <laughs> I, can't, I, I don't have time between watching... It's a lot of content. and like all the other dumb things I have to watch. Plus, I have to read all this, all these books. You guys I have There's... to read books. Well, the books that you're reading are terrible. <laughs> oh. I will have you know.
And I'm back. So we had the video there. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, discussion there, you'll see that uh, a lot of my ideas I um, <coughs> borrowed from my friends. But we also had a good discussion there um, where a lot of the things you heard in the, in the first part um, sort of carry through there. Uh, an interesting question that came through chat um, from uh, J.A. Pasco um, during the uh, video was, uh, another thing you didn't discuss much in the split was is the split between mechanics and flavor, where the latter can be more easily altered by changing the settings, either with published settings or, or by homebrew. And that is true. Um, you can mod, you can take the skins of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, there's even a thing called um, the OCL, Open OGL, Open Games License, where a stripped down version of fifth edition is available um, for anybody to use. It's an open source uh, type of thing. As long as you're using those as strictly defined in that area and you can make your own game based upon those mechanics. Now, those mechanics are still built on a system which uh, essentializes race. So you would have to find a way to work around that. And this is where the changing of setting, just taking the rules of D&D &D and throwing on a Call of Cthulhu game, throwing on a high school lifestyle uh, Stranger Things type game, um, throwing on a different skin uh, of that game um, could, could change the tone in which uh, you're, you're lessening or eliminating um, the race essentialism. But the problem is the mechanics. Now, you can change the mechanics, but there comes a point where you've changed the mechanics so much, you've become a new game. Um, think Pathfinder. Um, if those of you who are familiar with Pathfinder, that started off as, as a mod, a modification of Dungeons & Dragons 3.5, and then became its own game. Um, I think it was intentional, but that's the idea. As you change it so much, it becomes its own thing. Um, so that, that is the difference. You, if you're going to look for a system, um, if you're looking for a system that uh, eliminates these things, these are the kind of things you need to consider. Why am I not full screen? I'm doing more Q&A. Oh well, it's not harmful. It's just annoying. Ah. There we go. All right. Um, does that answer that part of the question? And then there was other parts about how we didn't really go into the implications of sort of the, the non-consensual natures of, uh, of orcs, of half-orc birth. And we'll leave that, leave that for now. You can look it up if you want to. So the second half of this thing now is we're going to walk away from the orcs a little bit. And that was sort of a case study, uh, if it were. Uh, now we're going to talk about what... What role does Archeo Gaming have in discussing tabletop role-playing games? And with that in mind, First, I think we're going to talk about what is Archeo Gaming. Um, I don't know if Sarah said that during her broadcast today, but we'll see, we're going to see plenty of examples of it during this Archeo Gaming Con. So it, it's pretty good to, to, to define what Archeo Gaming is. Um, Archeo Gaming, quoting here, Archeo Gaming broadly defined as the archaeology both in and of digital games. End quote. That 
quote is from uh, Andrew Reinhardt, and that is found in the book Archaeogaming. More, prop. More props. So in that, um, um, and we could say that Andrew and a lot of the uh, great innovators that you're going to see this weekend, um, the, the uh, foundational members of the uh, Archeo gaming community, um, have spent their time and work in the digital realm, in the realm of video games. Um, um, they have found plenty of sources to mine, no pun intended, because I think my next, there's a Minecraft one later today. Um, and they have plenty of things to, to work on in that community. Um, I sort of put a... So when, when coming together with Archeo RPG, um, as I mentioned, it was, a, it was a first and foremost a, a way to sort of reach out and use gaming as a method of communicating with the public of park archaeology, of, of maybe creating some games or modifying some games um, to change the archaeology mechanics within that game or create games with archaeology and archaeological methods and theories uh, to help teach uh, people about that. Additionally, uh, we wanted to use some of, this, uh, some, some of the similar techniques um, that Andrew and others are using um, with the digital archaeology into the space of the tabletop game. Um, because with the tabletop game, you are dealing with both um, physical and imagined artifacts. Um, your physical ones are obvious, as you see on the screen there. Dice. You got paper sometimes. You know, or now you're using computers to do all your uh, game playing on it. Dungeon Masters have screens. Some players print out their character sheets, or they have their character sheets online. Um, some players put out big map grid maps on the table with uh, painted figurines on it. Um, some make custom sceneries. Um, to fit those spaces. Others insert an uh, LED screen uh, into a table and project a game, uh, game top there with wind effects and water effects and all sorts of great crazy things. Um, so that's, a, that's the fit. Well, and it's the people, whether they're sitting there directly or around that single table or they're virtually talking to each other online um, through one, one of the various uh, services offered out there. Um, so there is a there is a physical materiality uh, to tabletop role playing. Game. There's the books, for goodness sakes, the books, the books, the books. Um, and now with some of the books, you can get them in PDF form or like Dungeons and Dragons. You could get them through services like D and D Beyond. Um, so even that is moving into a digital realm. That doesn't make them any less of an artifact. Um, it just transfers them into now um, imagined artifacts. Um, and as we were talking about so much during the uh, video there, imagine doesn't mean not real. Um, for, in a video game, if you're in Halo, Halo is a first-person shooter, you have a gun, you shoot space aliens. Um, if you sh get shot by an alien, your character is hurt. That affects your gameplay. None of that's happening. That's a code which is giving you visual cues um, that of something happening. And then there's a math going on to tabulate what your uh, current health is prior to having to reset uh, your character from a different location. Uh, but there's no real there. You, you didn't get shot. Uh, Master Chief didn't get shot. Master Chief's not there. The alien's not there. Um, but while you're playing the game, um, or at least this happens for a lot of players, um, there is a buy-in from the player, from the player perspective. Um, for that moment, you are Master Chief. You are trying to get away from those aliens. You know if you run into a rock, that rock will stop you. That rock's not there either. That's a digital creation. Um, but that rock's real because it blocks your path. Same is true in Dungeons and Dragons. Your characters, 
is imagined. You write, you write down on a piece of paper who your character is, and that's an imagined person. But when you're sitting around the game table, and, and you can ask this of almost any gamer over, who played for a while, any tabletop gamer, they will discuss their stories of their past adventures in the first person. We went to the dungeons and, and, and got back this reward. Remember when we all got killed in the, in the canyon over here? Remember when we did this and we did that? We didn't do anything. Um, you sat around and talked and rolled some dice and told a story. So, but it, it was real. Um, Cause it was real to them. It was real while they were playing. And when you're playing with the rules, if you go into a tavern, um, there are certain rules. You don't just walk through a wall. You agree that there's a wall in a certain place. Unless you got a certain bit of magic that makes you walk through walls. Uh, but otherwise you're not walking through that wall. You're respecting the boundaries given to you in the game. The boundaries given to you in the book. The book, as we, we were discussing, you know, the controversy early on there, but if you're playing a halfling, your movement speed is 25 feet per round, period. Because you're shorter, your legs are shorter, you can't keep up with everybody. You're five feet per round slower than everybody else. And you have to accept that. Or be a monk um, but that's how so you buy into the rules of the game you use if, if something you know in the book says it costs 50 gold pieces um, it costs 50 gold pieces now we've talked before it's the games are also a negotiation which makes it sort of a very interesting um, sort of type of setting because first you have the game developer who's creating the mechanics, the framework, and possibly even the adventure that you're going to be playing in. You have the, you have the game master, who is either going to be refereeing that game system and module that they got from the game developers or another game writer, um, or they will have written their own adventure and they're interpreting that uh, through the course of gameplay. And as such, they're making interpretations. As you see all along the line, there's interpretations being made. Um, the player character is listening to the dungeon master, um, understands the system in which they're playing in, um, understands what any modifications that the dungeon master wants to, game master wants to do to that system, and is now trying to play their character within that system. Sometimes they're pushing the limits of that system. They're gonna to try to find ways of maybe loopholes that the designer and the game master didn't anticipate. Um, maybe to an exploit, maybe not to an exploit. Um, you'll have some which are gonna be absolute strict rule followers and do exactly as they say, but that's still a style of gameplay. Um, so those are sort of the, the you know, the materiality going on there. So what, what can we learn and what can we tell? Um, well, through the physical uh, elements of it, um, if we were to find uh, old rule books from the 1970s that could tell us a little bit about how the game was played, well, that seems to be common and popular enough. There's nothing really going on there. Uh, another avenue uh, would be to find, and remember, with archeology, span we are not trying to find everything from the past. We can't. We are merely getting a segment, a sample of the past and trying to make some interpretations based upon that sampling. So when we are talking about this, um, a artifact from the past from role playing games could be the notes of a dungeon master from 1979, which was kept in the back of a closet, which a child has found adult child is found years years and years later um, after that uh, person has passed and wants to donate that to somebody those are artifacts of the past now historians may think it's theirs um, but it will take it um, old dice like like you get dodecahedron 12-sided dice uh, being found from Roman sites um, the idea of dice and dice play um, is important um, so role-playing games roll into sort of all the sort of types of gameplays. The, the history of dice 
itself is a fascinating one, and that goes back thousands of years. Uh, game playing goes back thousands of years. Um, the idea, you know, searching back to see um, the idea of role playing um, would be an uh, absolute interesting, uh, interesting level of study. So that's some of the areas of where um, tabletop role playing and the study of tabletop role playing as archaeo gaming um, could go. Okay, so yeah, there's the quote from Andrew Reinhardt, and there's uh, some of the examples of the physicality, the uh, physical artifacts of archaeo gaming. You got all those dice, all that paper, that uh, gridded map, and one inch grids. The 33 millimeter or 25 millimeter figures. I play digitally now, so I forget what size of the figures are. I don't have them anymore. Anyway. Those are all physical artifacts of tabletop role playing. So, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, the collaborative nature. Of this. Um, and this is a, a nice quote I found about role playing and sort of its, its play within the collaborative interactive fictions. Um, as texts which are based on collaborative and interactive narratives, tabletop, also known as pen and paper role playing games, TRPGs, are distinct in their technological simplicity. Indeed, in their traditional form, all they really require is the physical presence of a group of players commonly around a table, hence tabletop, who collaboratively participate in developing a narrative and a system of rules which allow resolving the outcome of situations in which different levels of chance may be involved. The need to write down statistic information makes them pen and paper. And that's by David Jarrah. That's a much, much more concise uh, explanation of uh, tabletop gaming than uh, I probably was rambling on for the last few minutes. So we'll go with that one. And let me go back. It's sort of another fundamental basis of uh, archaeo gaming from Andrew Reithardt in his book Archaeo Gaming, where he's discussing uh, uh, another archaeologist, Ian Hodder. So it's an archaeologist talking about an archaeologist with an archaeologist telling you about this right now. All right. So the quote. In Hodder's book, Entangled, an archaeology of the relationships between humans and things, he devotes the entire third chapter to the notion that, quote, things depend on things, end quote. Objects are beholden to operational chains and sequences and are dependent on materials, functions, and time. Things are dependent. Things also depend on people in order to be useful. These human-made artifacts entra entrapping people in long-term relationships of material interest, care, and maintenance." End quote. This is from uh, Hodder's book, Entangled, from tw 2012. Now, I bring this up because it's the... Mis the archaeologists have made a mistake in the past, and a lot of other people have too, of assuming an artifact has an inherent value. That there's something inherent about an object that makes it special. Um, where it's sort of the other way around. It's, it's, it's how the object was used, the context in which the object was, is located in, its, um, it's rarity, it's sort of a, everything outside of the actual object is, is, is what's really important about the object. Um, it's just its place within history, all, all the other things outside the physical thing uh, are, are more important. So you could almost say that the physicality of an artifact um, is not as important. And that's becoming sort of an interesting area within even actual archaeology as more artifacts are being digitized and cataloged as data, um, there's an interesting question about whether the artifact itself 
is a, is a uh, thing of importance. Um, but that's not for here. Um, that's for a discussion for another day. Um, but that goes to the idea that artifacts can be imagined. And as we discussed in that video, imagined can be real. And that imagined can be digital, or it can be strictly within the minds of the, or strictly living within a story that's being told among a group of friends around the table. And as you can see here, this is a collection of bookshelves. This is not even, this is not even truly representative of all the different RPGs that are out there uh, right now. I see uh, GURP, which I'm not even sure it's still published anymore. That might be out of print. Um, I see a 3.5 edition of Eberron for Dungeons and Dragons. So this is an older picture. There's a Call of Cthulhu guidebook there. I'm not even going to try to read the rest of them, but you can see there's a lot of stuff going on there. So there are many other systems to be played. We've been spending a lot of our time talking about Dungeons and Dragons today, but that's not as important. Um, all these things are attempts, um, as I said before, w with the uh, much better quote than mine, um, that in its core, tabletop role-playing is collaborative rules, uh, storytelling with rules and paperwork. And all these books here are about telling stories with rules and paperwork. Some of them, most of them will include dice, some don't, but they still have rules to, to, to solve matters. So I'm going to take a quote here from an Arthur Franco in the Proceedings of SB Games from an article titled An Ontology for Role-Playing Games. RPGs are proven to have a strong potential as a medium for telling interactive stories. So we take into account the models proposed in the modeling of RPGs and video games, in addition to practice from IS and their interactive storytelling and their criteria regarding planning are also considered in this first attempt to incorporate integrative storytelling planning models to understand the actions and control. So what this article was doing was trying to develop, we talk about the math now, uh, a, a mathematical way of looking at the ontology uh, of, role, of role playing games and interactive storytelling. Uh, so it's gotten to that point uh, of attempts uh, to be understood. Before I get to that part, I want to do one more thing because I have to do it. Uh, I want to talk a little more about Foucault. <laughs> um, uh, Foucault considered uh, discursive formations in terms of the threshold. Nah, I don't want to do that quote instead. Nope, I didn't include that one. You guys are lucky today. I lost my actual uh, Foucault quote. I'll put that in later. So, so that's trying to establish very roughly, very loosely, as you can see right now. Uh, one of the things I'm going to be doing this weekend is paying attention to a lot of these more developed uh, uh, theories and uh, methods in, in uh, archaeo gaming uh, to sort of work and refine the project that I'm working on. Now, the project which is Archeo RPG, as I've mentioned a few times, it's to create entertainment based upon actual archeological th methods and theories. The priorities of this group have been to one, educate a public through entertainment and to be a form of public archeology. span uh, Some of the shows uh, we have done so far, it's, it's been a scattering so far. We're still looking for that one groove um, to make it all sort of work and, and go. It's, 
and like any good science or anything, we're experimenting. Things work, things don't work. We learn from our, we learn lessons. We keep moving forward. Uh, Rituals and Rolls, which was our major live play D and D campaign. Um, everything I'm talking about, um, the videos do exist on the Archeo RPG YouTube channel, um, so they are there if you wish to watch them. Rituals and Rolls was the actual play live play D and D campaign. Um, it was based upon the Tomb of Annihilation uh, game for 5th edition of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, we had also been playing sort of a prequel from a smaller uh, module I had found. Um, and we had sort of stopped playing um, at the point where we got to the island. No spoilers, we hadn't gotten that deep in yet. Uh, and then life and pandemics have gotten in the way and that one is sort of on hiatus at the moment. Still digging. Still digging is still around. It's still our periodical uh, talk show format, probably the most popular show uh, on the network. And it's one that focuses on discussing sort of the intersection um, between archaeology, gaming, um, entertainment, or public cult pop culture, probably more than entertainment, um, and so forth, based upon really what's available uh, to discuss during that time period. Um, as you saw a sampling of early in, in this discussion. Um, CR, uh, oh, before I do CRM 2020, there was a short-lived Rituals and Roles recap. And I still like the idea, we just need to find out a way to make that one work. That would, the attention of that one um, is to have a recap show, a smaller half hour or so recap show, after Rituals and Roles, in which we could go into the actual archaeology that was discussed in the episode. Because we discovered early on, um, especially when playing an adapted work, or a pre-adapted work, like T Tomb of Annihilation, um, it's hard to bring in the archaeology and it's, unless it's already baked into the game. And the, we can't do the good archaeology unless that's baked into the game. So our best bet is to act our characters mindful of the archaeology we want to get across and then have a different platform which was going to be the recap show that would sort of uh, unpack that uh, for the audience. And then lastly and more recently and even more haphazardly <laughs> uh, we had CRM 2020. Um, our attempt at playing Cyberpunk 2020 um, it was a weird and wild adventure. I don't know if we did any archaeology in it, but we had fun. Uh, and those are available. That train wreck, and I mean the train wreck in the best way possible, um, is also available at uh, on the Archeo RPG channel. So with that, we have come to the closing of today. So what have we learned? Orcs aren't racist. You're racist for thinking orcs are racist or something like that. Um, we also learned, at least I think, tabletop role-playing game can be uh, examined through Archeo gaming. So I may be uh, in the woods, but that, that's me. So those are the two big takeaways from, from today. I would like to thank um, Sarah Head for bringing all this together uh, in a mere number of weeks. Uh, Christiana Krupa, who organized the hell out of this. Um, I'm still in a daze. I need to go look at the schedule because I may be in other things I don't know about. Um, and I sincerely want to thank Archeo RPG, which I've mentioned before. That's me. Thomas Cuthbertson, Amanda Gomes, and Sarah Head. Um, without them, I wouldn't be able to sort of really explore a lot of these questions over the past year and a half or so. So I want to thank them. The Archeo RPG logo is the one on top. The Archeo Thoughts logo is the one on the bottom. And the one on the very bottom of the screen is for the Archeo Gaming Con 2020. Use that hashtag, AgaCon when you're talking about us. All right, so it is, uh, we are now gonna take a break. You guys got a little bit of time. 
I don't even know the schedule. But you've got some time uh, before the next showing uh, with Christiana. I think you have till 1.30. But anyway, I do thank you all. And I hope I uh, got everything you want. Please, if you do have any questions for me, you can get me on Twitter at ArcheoThoughts. Um, yeah, that's 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 going to be the best place to get me. Uh, and I'll be more than happy uh, to answer all your questions on that. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the con. <laughs>